let's see here. And it looks like we're live. Hey y'all, this is David, the Georgia photographer. And today I'm going live instead of making a video. And what I want to do is a little bit of housekeeping right here. I'm going to do, I'm going to get my chat window popped out. There it is. And I'm going to bring it down here to where, hmm, it won't be quite so wide. I can kind of see what I've got started here. All right. Give me a note here. No one knows this stream's going live, so if you're happening to be watching YouTube, you'll see it. Now, I want to talk about two or three things today and then just do a general round robin chat where I take comments and we talk about subjects and things like that, which is kind of the way I seem to be doing live streams, just the way I do them. So, without further ado, let's uh, get into some stuff that I've noticed over the last week. I have been shooting with said Leica R8. I've been shooting with it enough that I've screwed up and left it on. Just like that. It was on just now. But I'm pretty sure that uh, we half pressed the shutter. Yep. It's got good hot batteries. Yeah, the battery indicator looks good. The batteries went dead. Now, that isn't a real big issue in this camera until you go to change them. The batteries are stored behind this front grip. You have to release this little latch. You can change the batteries with filming the camera. That's kind of nice. You have to release that little latch and then slide it down. There we go. And then once it moves a little bit, it'll come off. And inside of there is these two CR2 three volt cells, I think they are. But I've got some lithiums in it so that they'll keep a long time, as long as I don't leave it on. But the other ones, they lasted about a year, and I left it on a couple times, but I think it goes into sleep mode after a while. So I still got a good year out of them. But I've got a whole box of these batteries, so that shouldn't be an issue. They're pretty common. They're actually a normal size camera battery. But this camera takes stunning photos, and eventually I'll send off all my film and get it developed. I've got a whole bag full of it over there. And see what all I've got over the past year with this camera. I keep a roll of film in it, and I'll just grab it and go out and shoot some. I'll shoot some family stuff. I'll shoot some just landscape. I'll shoot some street stuff. Just whatever I happen to see. I just have this camera handy a lot of times, and I'll just take a photo of it. And that's the whole kind of point of this particular machine was that I wanted to have a camera on the gritty that I could just grab and take out and didn't have to check, make sure memory cards were empty, make sure that the batteries were hot, even though they went dead last night and I missed a photo because of it. It's just kind of ironic, but, <laughs> um, you know, it's just the way it works. Let's just put it that way. Okay. I'm gonna set that down now. But behind me, I have the cat. Let's see, can you see her? Um, if I do this, you can. Yeah, she's laid back here all piled up asleep. Another thing that's been real big in the news here lately that I want to go over is the Nikon Z8. That's like the thumbnail. It's a Nikon Z8 kind of chat. But the, the Z8 has been in all the news lately. It's all the buzz and everybody's want to talk about it. So I've got some information that I want to go over with you guys and give you my thoughts on this camera. Coming from a person who owned a Nikon D810, which is in that kind of family of cameras, give you my thoughts on what's coming up with that. I got a little bit more um, updating to tell you about. I've got this camera out and I've installed the Nikon the web utility for a web camera and I have checked it with this short USB cable and I've got it to work as a webcam so I can have dual cameras. What that'll allow me to do is be able to switch views whether I want to share the amateur radio station or if I want to have a product demo table or something of that nature. Oh, it's an email. Um, I can show you that with a second camera so I'm gonna be working on finding a spot to set that up and be able to get a second camera going so that I can have you know whether it be 
top down or product demo or you know the outdoor view whatever i want to share with it i'll be able to do it but i got to get a longer usb cable this one it just it isn't long enough but and this is all kind of interim until i get my main computer back so you know currently it's still in the shop so whatever it's just the way it works okay let's see here um let me get up here get this panel brought up now I've shut off all the Google ads, isn't so I just I don't bother to run ad blocks. It's just here we go. So what you see here is the Nikon D850, the Z8 as leaked to Nikon rumors, and the Z9. And if you was to scoot the Z8 up, Z8 up even with the top of the Z9, you can see they literally lopped off the battery grip area and it's the same size physically as the Z9 without the bottom grip. It's a very very similar footprinted camera and that's what I would come to expect when you when you start looking at this. You can uh, like if I select this it'll open it up as a bigger image and you can see it's basically the exact same size as the old D850 except it'll be a little thinner because there's no shutter mechanism there's you know and there's no pin -a prism in the top so they don't need all that they're utilizing this space for electronics now the evf has some uh, glass in it has a little bit of a glass mechanism that they have to be able to focus for people like me with bad eyes so they still need some of that space for that and then they have the evf and its associative electronics and that's what this takes up now where this had a glass pen -a prism that looked down to the mirror in the mirror box which looks through the lens you know they just replaced it that's why this nodule is still on top of these cameras it they need the room but the camera does get a little smaller and a little lighter because of that let me go back and get back on the uh, hey good it didn't bring up the pop-up ads just this one there <laughs> but they've uh got a mock-up he posted last year but I read the the article and basically the specs are very d850 ish let's see here no that's another one this is this was posted yesterday as an update to this article which was where he talks about some of the specs but mainly the size in comparison to a D850 and a Z7. That's what he's using here. But he's, you know, for reference photos. So you can kind of get a footprint idea of where it's going to be. But these bullet points were really interesting to me, especially 8K video, 60 frames per second. That's incredible. But yeah. You know, it, of course it won't have all the Z9 features. I mean, that's that goes without saying. Why would you put all the flagship features in your non-flagship camera? You know, you want to leave a little bit of breadcrumbs on the table. But, you know, uh, of course, they're describing... He says it was described to him as a hybrid between the Z7 and the Z9. And, honestly, that makes sense. It's just going to be the semi-pro or pro small-body cameras, what, you, what I'd classify it as to where you know the Z6 and 7 are really enthusiast cameras the the 800 series DSLRs were were basically pro cameras without the grip and then you had the flagships which were gripped cameras uh, I'm curious about the EVF I've always been big on the EVS and that was one of the reasons I switched to the Leica SL2 the one I'm filming with right now the EVF and it for its time was the most advanced highest resolution EVF ever put in a camera and finally the other manufacturers are starting to catch up with it it's got I think it's 5.4 million dots I'd have to look but it's a lot it's so high resolution that it's almost like looking through an optical viewfinder it's that good and the Nikons and I'm pretty sure the Canons I don't know Phil Thatch will have to weigh in on that. He did a stream the other day about this as well. So he has different thoughts. 
it'd be worth your trouble to just listen to his stream and to watch it for the anecdotes because he has events occur in his stream that are something like I would have in mind. He has, he has fun with his cameras. You should watch it. It's worth it. <laughs> um, but the, the EVF is something that I've always really, really liked and always really enjoyed using. Mainly because now that I'm wearing glasses, it's really difficult for me to be able to review images on the back of the camera without my reading glasses because I've, I've kind of lost the ability to see up close. As I get older, that, that's moving further away. But with the EVF, you focus it to your eye. So you just look through the EVF and you can review photos, you can make menu changes, anything. If your glasses get dirty or something, you know, or heaven forbid you leave them in the car or whatever, you can still see with you know what's going on with the camera and be able to work with it. And to me, that was a win-win. And then when they got so good that you, it was like just looking through the lens on an old SLR or DSLR, I was all, I'm all in. I love the EVF idea. Now, the improved autofocus is the next line item. And I'll be honest with you, that's where Nikon is behind the curve. It's getting better. The Z9 uh, is incredible. The Z6 II, Ray Soldano has a Z6 II, or still has it. And the autofocus on that thing is uncanny. He almost, um, he was joking one day about how he was running the new, he's got the Gen 2 Tamron 70 to 200, and he's like, it's almost cheating. It works so well. And it's so fast and accurate. So yeah, they're getting there. And with the Z9, the autofocus seems to be incredible. He has, he has wonderful luck with it. So it's telling me that it's working. And he shoots sports. He's got some photos of like the dirt coming off of the softball as the bat hits it and things like that. It, it's, it's incredible. The same sensor as the Z9. And the Z9 has a really, really advanced sensor. I don't know exactly if it's like a, a stacked backside illuminated double C moss zirconium oxide special moon dust sensor, but it's got a really good sensor in it. And they're saying that the Z8 will have the same sensor. And that's, that's kind of unusual in my book because all of the flagships up to this point have had lower resolution sensors so that they performed really well in low light because wedding photographers typically shoot indoors in poor lighting conditions. So they need good um, high ISO performance or you know good light gathering. So you would still see like 20 megapixel sensors in the D4 and D5. It, they never went to like the 40 megapixel sensors in those big machines. But then the Z9 came along and it's, I think it's 45 or 47 megapixels. It's a lot, which kind of surprised me, which tells me that they finally kind of solved the high ISO issues associated with the older high res sensors. Like my old D8 or D810 had a 36 megapixel sensor and it was terrible at high ISO. So yeah, that, that kind of shocked me. And for it to share the sensor with the next model down it's kind of odd to me because, like I said, before you had like a 20 or a 21 megapixel sensor in the flagship and the D850 had a 45 megapixel sensor in it. So that was that was a diversion from the old methodology as well. Let's see. Okay, they're talking about the announcements expected for before summer. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to happen like next week. They're going to do, you know, the, the launch announcement is what... Um, pretty much everybody's saying, you know, toward the end of the month, there's some kind of a big event supposed to happen like on the 25th in the Philippines. And I'm pretty sure that's the launch event. Don't quote me on that. And then of course the price, the price is where I have a sticking point issue. These cameras are technically simpler to build than the DSLRs were. There's not as many mechanical moving parts anymore. It's almost all solid state now. You do have moving parts. You have knobs and dials and buttons. The D850 also had knobs and dials and buttons, but it also had a mirror mechanism, a focus motor that drove 
screw drive focus lenses. It had a pin of prism that had to be ground perfect. It had all of this, uh, it has, had a separate focus sensor in the side of the camera that was separate that's over here in this area of the camera. You know, there was a lot of stuff in here that drove cost way up that's not in this camera. And I'm gonna just switch back. And I don't see the $4,000 price tag. What I see is that's just a, this, I'm, I'm gonna use it as barrier to entry. They're, they're trying to play the Leica game, is what I, in my opinion, is not, the camera's not worth $4,000. It's, I'm sorry, you know, you got your engineering money back in the Z9s now. They've been selling as fast as they make them. They've recovered that engineering cost. The D850 is literally trickle down effect engineering. They didn't have to do a lot of specific work other than, you know, they modeled it up and, you know, they had to fit the stuff on it, but it's it's literally a slightly grown Z7 with some of the electronics out of the Z9. You know, there is a reasonable amount there, but is there $4,000 worth? I don't think so. I really think that this camera should be no more than three grand. Twenty nine ninety five would be my ceiling on this camera. Because at 4,000, you're approaching like a SL2 ranges, which is, it, they're inflated. Let's all be honest here. You know, it's a barrier to entry. But is it, I don't know if it's got enough value separation between 4,000 and right now, you can get Z9s for like $5,800, $5,700. Somebody said they saw Z9s on sale somewhere for like $5,700. If I'm that close to a Z9, why would I why would I pick the lesser machine if I'm going to use it for a long time or even if I'm going to flip it and sell it in a year, what's the value at the end of the day? What's the value proposition that says, you know, spend a little more. At this point, you're already $5,000 in. I mean, once you put sales tax on that camera, it's going to be $4,300, $4,400, you know, I just don't see the, uh-oh, I have messed myself up, there it is, that's weird, it's like there's nobody in the chat, I don't understand that, huh, let's see, go back to here, there's people here, is it, leave me a message in the chat so I can make sure that the, the chat box is working because I'm not seeing anything. I've dropped a message into it, but there's people online. I see it shows there's viewers. Hmm. And if you haven't done it yet, hit the like button. I appreciate that. It'll kind of tell YouTube to share it with other people. But yeah, I just don't know if the if the value proposition is there. For the the whole, the whole thing to be worth four thousand, they're saying forty five hundred Canadian is what they're expecting, and they don't know if that's going to be with it with a kit lens or what. Let me see if I've got some here. I'm getting text messages, so we are chatting away. Why ain't my chat box working? Let me see. Oh, uh, interesting. Live chat. There we go. Maybe that's what I was doing wrong. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at that. I had the, it said it had it marked as top chat, and there is all kinds of stuff going on in the chat. Hey, y'all. <laughs> I was waiting and waiting and waiting. I was like, where's everybody at? <laughs> I will be so happy to get my old computer back because I know where the buttons are and I can see stuff and right now I'm working with this notebook computer and I'm not used to using OBS on it and it, it has things laid out different. <laughs> oh. Man. 
Ah, okay. Doing what cats do. Hi, Ron. How you doing? If you're still here. <laughs> it could be. It could very well be my next camera. If it is the mirrorless D850. Ah, Ray's right. It's a great camera, but man, I mean, you're this close to another Z9. It would almost just be my M. To me, it would just almost be worth the extra little bit. So you have a pair of Z9s. You can literally clone the setting control button layout and everything to the second camera and just put two lenses on that are different and you know the settings you know your you know the ergonomics you don't have to learn a second machine it just it just makes so much sense that way that's the only thing i don't like about my sl2 which is floating around here somewhere in a little tiny camera bag right over there and my or my sl2 which is i'm streaming on but and my cl is the physical layouts are different and so i'm um, at some point i got to decide do i want to continue messing with that cl or the sl2 and i want to combine those into the same model so i have two of the same models so i have a redundant backup but yeah it's an you know <laughs> Whew. i have dropped zero frames all right, let's see. Probably my next camera. Oh, <laughs> I don't have to have the latest. The D850 is still awesome, and it is an awesome camera. I have seen some glorious photos taken on a D850. Let's see. I'm at the point when I have to per. I have probably purchased my last camera body. Having the Z62s is really all I need, and don't see a need since I am not a pro. Now, if I was making money at photography, this is Ron Durant, who actually sells prints. <laughs> I would consider spending money for a new body, but the Z6 II does all I need. The Z6 II is an incredible camera. Ray takes stunning photos with his, and you do too. I've seen your photos. Those waterfalls are epic. It's easy to do, David, at 20 frames per second. <laughs> You're basically grabbing stills out of video at that point. <laughs> Let's see. Woo. Use Pro to Pro quoted me 630 trade in on what? Uh, 150,000 shutter count. Oh, oh, his cameras is he's selling off his cameras. Yeah. Chad is working. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, Ron makes a good point. The um, once the D, once the Z8 drops, the Z73 and the Z63. Well, he says that um, they won't be coming out. Though I think they'll be coming out way later. Uh, there's a there's a market for those D700 series and D600 series cameras, which is what the Z6 and Z7 kind of imitate. And people buy them. People use them a lot. But yeah, that I think that that won't drop super soon. That's going to be expensive. All right, I'm going to jump back over. Now let's see here. <coughs> Excuse me. It will use the same battery as the Nikon Z7. At least that's the speculation is that the ENEL15C and the C is USB powered devices capable charge. Um, if I understand it right. Those are really good batteries. I've, I've had great service out of the one I bought. I bought one or two when I had my Z6 and it would power off the, the, the Gen C battery and yeah, it worked fine. Um, a dedicated USB-C power delivery port for part charging and continuous use. And that was something that I don't know that the SL2 initially came with, but I'm using it now and it's working. I've got a USB power pack plugged in to my SL2 and a battery in it, and it the battery in it has stayed fully charged. So that's working. So this is, this is a good thing, especially if you want to do live streams or lots of video. This is super handy. The 9 megapixel EVF is, is now, 
when they say megapixel, I'm curious, is that 9 million dots, like you used to hear, or is that actually 9 million pixels that you're seeing? You know, because back in the day, they were trying to, like, inflate the numbers by saying, you know, 3 million dots. Well, you had a million red ones, a million green ones, and a million blue ones, and it would only turn on whatever colors it needed for each pixel, which meant you only had one actual megapixel. So I'm curious to know if that's actually a nine megapixel EVF. If that is, that's lunacy. That's twice as twice as high as this SL2, and this, and it's almost twice as high as the EOS R3. That's crazy high numbers. And then he's got a little recap thing here. But yeah, that's incredible. All right, that's. In, but this was this was interesting though, in that let me see back up here. The, the pictures, you know, here you go, the Z6, Z8, and Z or Z7, Z8, and Z9, and you can see the step size variance. But yeah, if you was to cut this one out and move it straight up till the tops were even, it you can see that they just basically cut this one off right through there. <laughs> it's just. It's the same camera other than that. Well, I mean, you got this mode dial and they, they made a few subtle changes, you can tell. But yeah, I like it. I like the camera. I'm curious to see how it performs. I wonder if it's gonna be kitted with the 24 to 72 8 like they've got it pictured with here in the mock-up. Cause you know, the Z7 is kitted with the 24 to 70 F4 like they have in this picture. Did they do kits with the Z9 with the 24 to 70? Because they probably cut this lens out and photoshopped it into this Photoshop rendering. Supposedly, this is a um, a leaked image that Nikon Rumors got his hands on. All right, yeah, I'm gonna transition back, pull the chat back up so I can see what everybody has said. So Ray, how close is it? Yeah. See. <laughs> once you once you see a good high quality EVF, they finally have come into their own. Bass Angler's talking to Ray, you know, how close is the EVF to say the D five hundred optical viewfinder? And to me, like it used to have lag on the earlier ones, but the lag really ain't an issue now. They've got the processor power up to where it's basically instantaneous. I'm just torn between picking up a, another D500 and a D850 or going to the Z9 to access to all the new glass like the 800F63. Yeah, that lens makes sense for you. With the whole Eagle photos and, and such that you're doing, I understand your logic there. But maybe you could get an F mount 600 millimeter with a 1.4 teleconverter, you know, and, and that'd make you somewhere around 850 millimeters, 900 millimeters, I don't know, somewhere in that neighborhood. And it would probably be significantly cheaper than the Z mount glass. Now, the Z mount glass is nice and has a built in teleconverter, but good lord, is that expensive. That's crazy high up there. Yeah, Ray says zero noticeable lag in the Z9. Yeah, it's like I said, the processor power has finally caught up. And the Z9 has the most up to date processor that Nikon has. It's their it's their flagship. So it's gonna be the, the best of the best of the best. It would have it would have greatly surprised me had there been lag in that EVF. Just more broke. <laughs> All right, let's see. Y'all are chatting amongst each other. Woody Mallory says, just wait until the camera comes out. Then we will know what it has. Every camera YouTuber has opinions. Yeah. <laughs> and non 
YouTubers alike. That's a good point, though. But, I mean, it gives us something to talk about in the interim while we wait, you know? <laughs> oh, get a little bit of water here. Um, I brought this up early on. I've installed the live stream software or the, yeah, webcam utility from Nikon and tested it with my Z50 and a USB cable and it works, but my cable's so short I really can't do anything, so I'm gonna get me a longer cable. I'm gonna set up a second camera. Ray, Ray suggested it, so I'm gonna use that idea. Wow. That's incredible. He says, Ray says 20 frames per second is so fast that I usually turn it down to 15 frames per second as a sweet spot unless I'm shooting what he says is softball batters. Wow, that's incredible. Now, there's photos. If you go to Ray Soldano Photography, I'm pretty sure he's got an Instagram account that he's been posting it on. There's some incredible photos of sports that he's been capturing with his Z9. If you want to see what it can do, there's examples. He's got some really incredible photos. You know, indoors, he's been shooting like volleyball, I think, and basketball. And so he's inside of the gymnasium. So there's your terrible lighting scenarios that he's been working with. And, and he can vouch most indoor event arena locations have hideous lighting. It'll be weird color temperatures or there's not any of it. You know, it's just something terrible about indoor venues and their lighting is always atrocious. <laughs> uh. Oh, he's got new memory cards. Bass Angler says, I'm waiting on Dave's moon dust sensor. <laughs> Uh, I need to make a whole video about manufacturing a moon dust sensor. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> <clears throat> but the the idea the idea is still valid. I mean, you know, the next the next thing that they got to quit. What they're kind of bothering me with is they keep wanting to make the photo sites smaller and smaller so that they get more pixels on a 24 by 36 millimeter wafer. And I understand that's an easy marketing point. You know, now we have 90 megapixels. Now we have 200 megapixels. Now we have gigapixel sensors. Stop trying to make more pixels on the sensor. At this point, the resolution is lunacy. When you got 45 megapixels, to work with, the prints are already six by seven feet natively. It's lunacy, it, you know, 72 DPI prints, you can easily, it's like mine is literally like 8,300 pixels wide. You know, if you even did 300 DPI, that's still 20, 30 inches wide, but you know, at, at 300 DPI, it's crazy the size of the images you can print now. What I want is for them to dump a bunch of their research and engineering into improving ISO performance, either in the algorithm that the software uses with the processor to process the data stream coming from the sensor, work on improving the sensor read. Right now they read it in lines. That's how you get the whole distortion effect from rolling shutter is the read speed is too slow and the object that you're photographing moves slightly as it as it reads here it moves over here by the time it finishes that scan across the sensor and you're in and you know like round the balls look squished because of that and so that's I'm done we got a lot of sensor I mean if you want bigger megapixels go to bigger sensors get the gfx get something you know medium or large format phase ones or whatever you know there's ways to get bigger images you can either stitch you can do pixel shift this thing does pixel shift and does a 183 megapixel image 
it's an insane image that it'll capture. You have to shoot it on tripod and keep it dead still, but I think it, it combines like eight or nine images. It shifts the pixel from the center. It shifts it over, up, over, over, down, down, over, over, up, and back to center, something like that, and combines all that and creates this 180-something megapixel image. So, you know, if you really want super giant megapixel images, there's ways to get them now. Stitching is just the easiest one. I mean, literally, that's accessible to anybody. You know, multi-shot stitches are not an issue. You can do them, you can literally do grids and they'll stitch. It's, it's available. And I just want them to improve ISO performance. I would like to see us to be able to shoot at 25 and 52,000 ISO and the noise look like 800. That's what I want to see. You know, and Leica figured it out with the um, the monochrome series. When they removed that Bayer sensor array, that Bayer array, the filter array off of the sensor to, that makes it see in color, now I think it's the blue, loses like two or three or four stops of light. I don't remember. The red and the green and the blue all lose different amounts of light as it passes through that, that, that Bayer filter. And I think the blue one loses the most. So they dumb down the other two to balance the colors or the exposures so all three of them see the same. But you automatically lose, you know, instead of 6,400 that would go to 12,000, 25,000, 52,000. Well, now you choke it back 6,400 is your max of usable ISO. That's why those Leica Q2 monochromes can shoot at 52,000 ISO and it looks good. They're shooting in the dark literally in the dark and the images look great it's but, but they're monochrome you know because they took that bayer filter off i'm just i want them to invest the engineering in that that's where i think that and global global shutter or global sensor read like when they can get it to where the processor power is powerful enough to grab the whole sensor photosite information stream at once maybe even grab it dump it to a buffer and then process it out so that you can continue to shoot have two processors one to process the memory one to drive the sensor and be able to do global captures that eliminates rolling shutter 100 percent and your sensor speed or your shutter speed can be whatever you want literally it can be one one hundred thousandth of a second with global reads there's no issue in, in scan time now. You just pull the data in, move it into a register, process it in the background, and let the other processor work the sensor. I see how it could work. I just am not educated in how to do it. But that's, I think those two would be my next biggest breakthroughs that I would want to see. Not, not this. I mean, you know, you've got three versions of the same camera. That's what I see here. You got Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. You know, that's that's literally what this looks like to me. And I shot a D810. This size is perfect for my hand. I like this this center one, and I added the battery grip. It's because I like the extra battery. That was nice. And it only added one, so you only had two, but with two batteries in the D810, I never had to change batteries in the field. It would run all day. So I'm curious to see what battery life on the digital version, you know, the full electronic camera will be since, you know, to look through the viewfinder, you use energy to where on the D810 you didn't. You know, I'm just curious to see what battery life is, but um, I think Ray can testify that the let me move this back, that the Z9 has insane battery life. Of course, it has the big boy battery. It has the, the powerhouse in it, but that's interesting. The other thing about 45 megapixels is camera shake. You have to use faster shutter speeds, which isn't, which isn't always optimal or desirable. That's right, John. And this here, Ray says, I really like the Z9 form factor, but I've always like a camera with a vertical grip me too and i currently don't have one 
Yeah, I had I when I had my D seven thousand, I bought the vertical grip and used it that way. And then when I got my D eight ten, I got the the vertical grip for it and used it the whole time with the vertical grip and loved it. And so, yeah, if I get another knock on body, it will be a significant step up from this little guy. <laughs> this camera is great for what I use it for. I, I don't knock the Z50 at all. This is a wonderful little camera, but I like that big camera form factor. I guess because I, I like the the size of the camera body with the grip on it. You know, Phil doesn't like it. He don't like grips. I do. I don't have one on the SL2 just because I haven't looked for them. I know they're out there. You know, I, I just soon not buy a new one because they're like a thousand bucks or something. They're kind of expensive for a battery grip for a Leica, but I would use it if I had one. It'd be on the camera. But the camp, but the Leica, the SL2, without the vertical grip, still has enough grip space that my whole hand fits on it. And you know, even this little Z50, it just works. My my little finger runs off a little bit, but there there's actually enough grip there that I can catch it with my little finger. It's there, so it's not the size. Of, I don't know what that was. It looked like something fell off the camera, but it's all there. The size of this is almost big enough. So yeah, I'm kind of happy with the way Nikon's doing things, and they're. Their grip typically doesn't interfere. As long as I run F-mount lenses, they're small enough here at the junction that my knuckles don't hit. Now, I haven't really messed with enough Z-mount glass on this camera to know if the Z-mount lenses would give me issue, but I have never had issues like I did with my Sony's where my knuckles would rub on the lens and it would rub sore spots on my knuckles. This Nikon's have never done that. Hassan's in. Morning. Thank you for stopping by. Ray said maybe if Phil had a bigger camera, he would stop dropping them. <laughs> uh, Phil has this affinity for setting his camera in precarious positions and then seeing how durable they are by testing it. <laughs> He's had them roll off the roof of the car, like slide off the roof <laughs> he's had all sorts of you know terrible fates befall him he had a, he drowned in an r7 the other day it fell into the river while he was doing waterfall photography he just has the heart the worst luck with cameras like all his hot shoes are broke off <laughs> it's like man he's just i th i understand why he doesn't like want to put a lot of value into the body because he he uses them he ain't afraid to get them out and use them and do stuff yeah, maybe you'd stop dropping them. <laughs> Harold Bartlett says, I love my Z50. It's small lens and a walkabout camera. Yeah, right now I've got the 10 to 20 F mount Nick or it's a DX lens on it. And I use it for video. This is a little video rig for me. I'll add the, I have the Rode Video Micro that I'll drop in the hot shoe and plug into the microphone jack because it actually has a mic port. They planned on this being a little vlogging camera, so they put a dedicated mic board on it so I can plug it straight in. And that works really well. I got some stuff coming up. I'm going to shift gears now and talk about something else. This is what I've been recording my audio with for about the last two or three years. This is the Zoom F1 field recorder. And what it's meant for is just for you to like, if you're out, like if you're a, um, an archaeologist and you just want to do audio recordings of while you're out, you can just drop this thing on your belt, stick the lav mic on your lapel. It's just got a record button. You hit record, you talk, you hit it again, it stops. This creates off-camera audio for me, and it works shockingly well. It's easy to sync and post, and the audio coming out of the Zoom brand electronics, their processing, is really good audio. These, this thing has worked great until the other day. I got it out and the battery door had broke off. The little latch, this plastic that it hooks on and that latch has broke off the battery door. So I've got it taped on with electrical tape while I used it the other day. So I got the Zoom F2, which is the replacement for this aging piece of equipment. And they've made several noticeable improvements. Like this one has a limiter function. And what that does is that sets 
algorithmically the maximum audio sound out of this device to minus 6 dB so you don't get clipping and you don't get that when you talk too loud. Well this, you had to manually set it with this limiter function and I just left that on all the time. But this one, it's built into the software so that it does it automatically all the time. And this one still works. So if I go on a, like a photo walk with somebody, I can mic somebody else now as well as myself. But yeah, I got me a new field recorder because I really enjoy the audio that comes out of these. That It just works really, really well for me. And this one, even though it's broken, like I said, the battery door, as long as you hold it on with tape, it has this port on top. And back over there in the corner, I have the little double mic deal that you can put on it and then I can actually stick it on a hot shoe and uh, be able to somebody's calling Teresa <laughs> but that'll allow me to mic this thing up for like a lecture recording or if you wanted to hold it in your hand and do interviews like if you're just walking around in a crowd and you want to interview people like if you go to Photokina you can just take that and do audio and do it like a news reporter. So I've got that little widget for this. Plus, I'm probably going to look at figuring out a way of making a latch that will hold the battery cover on. Because the electrical contacts, it's got two AAA batteries. The electrical connection is right there between them. And if I can come up with a way of making something that will snap onto here out of Kydex plastic, for instance, that will reach up through this hole and hold that on. It'll work fine. It won't even look as goofy as it does with the yellow electrical tape. But yeah, this thing has been has been a great device. I kind of felt bad when I seen it die. <laughs> Nothing lasts forever. But I got a new one, so I'm back in business. You could also get a 360 mic. Minus 6 dB, that's a terrible antenna. <laughs> that's an attenuator. That's not even an antenna. Ron's gone. See ya. Thank you for hollering at me. Sun is shining. Oh, he's going out to do photos, I guess. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I almost got... Yeah, addressing Ray. I almost got a set of those Rode Wireless Go. You know, you got the kit with two of them in it and the little charging thing and all that. But I just don't, I don't see the value for me in that thing because it's very expensive for them. This thing was only like a little over a hundred bucks, and this one has lasted and still works. So that's that gives me a default second mic since this one still actually functions, and. Uh, yeah, I just added to it and got the other, got the new field recorder. It's, uh, it's kind of my workflow. But I thought about, I almost got the little tiny video camera like Phil and, um, now I can't think of his name. <laughs> I watched his video this morning. Oh, Tim, both of them have the, the little uh, DJI pocket Osmo thing. I almost went ahead and ordered one, but man that's kind of expensive just when this works perfectly and all i needed i honestly could continue to use this by just willing to deal with the electrical tape <laughs> yeah i just didn't want to go all in just yet oh okay yeah for ambient sound recording that's a, that's a good point hmm I never really considered that much um, Phil said he was using his iPhone to somehow connect I guess because he's got that M1 Mac and it was acting as a auxiliary webcam and I messed with my MacBook Pro here which is fairly old and couldn't get it to like do that so and I didn't try hardwiring it because it always wants to launch iTunes if I do that, so I haven't synced to iTunes in ages. Ah. Oh, well, I've got all that out of the way. 
what else was I having on here that I was going to talk about? I had something else. Where's it at? Oh, guys, I have completely forgot. There was another subject. Man, <laughs> I hate it when I do that. <sighs> Dave's about to hit 5,000 subs. Come a long ways from the broken ankle vlogs. Oh man, you remember those. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Yeah, it's easing up there. I think I like about 13 to make 5,000. Yeah, it'd be nice if I could get 5,000 in one day. Pretty sure that's not going to happen, but it might. You never know. Today it's running good. I have zero drop frames. You need a notepad for talking points. I just didn't write them down. <laughs> I was in a hurry this morning and because I had a, a little free time today and it I just started gathering things up. So here I am. I got this out and I was knew I was gonna talk about it and uh, the Z8 info, I wanted to go over that. And I think that's it. I mean, what's that about? Oh, that's an ink pen. Okay. Uh, one thing I did want to talk about that I haven't uh, discussed much, and I don't know if I have any Leica shooters in the stream currently, Probably don't, but Leica lost a few new SL lenses the other day. They're aspheric instead of apo lenses, which apochromatic are better than aspheric. Aspheric does like image correction only, and the apochromatic are also, I think, aspherical, but they're a little bit, a little bit less expensive. They're still primes, and they're really nice lenses, but they're a lot smaller and lighter. That would make for great street photography glass. But I've already got the 50 millimeter APO over there. So if I'm going to shoot straight with the SL2, I'll probably use it since it's a wonderful lens. The, the guys on Red Dot Forum were doing their stream the other day about them. And they were talking about basically they had the 35, but the 50 and the 35 are virtually identical. The 35 edges it out if you use a computer to read the specs. But to the human eye, the 50 and the 35 produce the same results and they joked that um, the uh, the 50 millimeter apo summicron was sharper in the corners than like um, the m mount lenses were sharper in the center <laughs> they're that much better than the m lenses <laughs> they were, yeah these things are insane how good they are even the even the 24 to 90 is that good it's just lunacy how good they are they they like pulled out all the stops on them lenses let's see if i not miss something okay uh, let's see i did have something else up here what was it i don't remember now let me see if i can find it right quick No, I've got everything on here. I went through the spec list. Yeah, 9 megapixel EVF was the last thing. I made sure that I didn't miss anything there. But yeah, that, that Z8 is going to be a nice camera. But is it nice enough for the small disparity between it and a Z9? I, I see people that want a smaller body with Z9 functionality. There's Those people exist. You know, to circle back to that for a minute. There's people like Phil who like the smaller body, you know, so that they're targeting a, a demographic that is there, but is it, is it worth $4,000 or 4500 Canadian? That's a lot, which I think is, you know, people are speculating it's going to be around 4000 US. That's, that's a hard pill to swallow for an intermediate level machine when the flagship's just a little bit more. You know, it's gotten to the point now to where, honestly, the value of the dollar has dropped to the point to where 
a thousand bucks difference isn't that much. It used to be it was a huge difference, but nowadays it really ain't. It's it's literally just it's not that big a deal anymore. Hassan says the new Leica 100-400 is nice also and pretty nicely priced for a Leica. Yeah, but it's enormous. Ah, let me see. Let me see what Teresa wants. Hello. I'm live streaming. I'm currently on the air taking this call live on YouTube. <laughs> no, I'm doing it now. Hmm. And she hung up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was kind of funny. <clears throat> but four thousand dollars is like twelve thousand dollars Canadian. <laughs> four thousand U.S. <laughs> I think that's the Australian dollar conversion, isn't it? <laughs> it's like some kind of crazy number. <laughs> I know it's more, <laughs> but <woo. laughs> no, she wasn't mad. It's all good, guys. <clears throat> I know yesterday, did I bring my logbook in or is it still in the truck? I think it's still in the truck because I'd done all my log paperwork yesterday. I did a, I did what is known on Parks on the Air as a rover. I'm just going to wander down the... Um, amateur radio hole for a few minutes rover means you activate five parks in one universal time coordinated day one utc day so you have to know when the day starts it doesn't start at midnight like it does on a regular clock it starts at greenwich mean time zero so for us that's about 4 a.m i think is utc zero so with um but that being known, I started yesterday morning. Was it yesterday? No, it was the day before yesterday. I've done this two days ago now. Man, time flies. Yesterday we spent all day in business meetings. Long story. But yeah, I started out and went down Lookout Mountain and drove up through the Chickamauga Battlefield up into Tennessee and finished on the fifth park in Tennessee. Made like a hundred, almost 120 contacts in a day's time from five different locations over the day. And it was actually a lot of fun. I went by myself and just, you know, just had, it was just me and my radio all day. And I used this little tiny radio here. Uh, I have it handy. Yeah. I, it. Yeah, here it is. I used this little tiny radio. <laughs> There's a blog that I write and it'll come out, it, um, I scheduled the blog post for April about this event, but this one I used for the first four parks and then I used my ICOM IC705, which is still in the truck for the last one just because I wanted to play with a different radio. This radio works surprisingly well for a little compact five watt or less. You can turn the RF power down with this button, the knob morse code radio this thing works surprisingly well these it's a ham operator that designed it and built it and yeah i like this radio it it goes most of the time with me when i operate out of the truck i have antennas i rig in the trees that are wire and those that those i use when it's warmer because you go to a picnic table and you rig it up from a picnic table usually because the parking lot's normally not conducive for that, but if I can rig up from a table or somewhere a park bench or something, then I'll I'll do wire antennas in the warmer weather because they seem to work a little better. But in the winter, I use those ham sticks on my truck and this little guy most of the time. I do get out the other ones. I have two or three other smaller radios I do take from time to time, but for the most part, it's that little guy. It just It just works. Hassan says, oh, what, 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 what? oh, you guys have went down the rabbit hole. <laughs> John Trevina says, Canon and Nikon have 80 years experience with super telephotos. And that's true. And they have, they have provided the uh, hardware to photograph like all the major sporting events 
since cameras have been used to photograph them. So, you know, that's, that's, that's one of their specialties. And Laka never really attacked that. You know, they've made some big telephoto glass in the past. They've got some, but... Oh, before my battery goes dead. Come on. There you go. Let's see what we got now. I'm surprised that the battery indicator didn't tell on me. Oh, that's OBS. Okay. That's interesting. There's a little, there's a little orange dot. Oh, the battery's actually in shockingly good shape. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, it says power source, power adapter. All right, good. <clears throat> I had the, the speaker had pushed down on the MagSafe connector and had disconnected it, and I noticed the little lamp was out. Hmm. But, let's see here. Bass Angler says, I wish the whole world would go to UTC. It wouldn't take long to get used to it. It would be a lot simpler. <clears throat> Does everybody be on the same timetable? Yeah, that whole East Eastern Standard Time and, you know, Pacific time, mountain time, Hawaiian time. You know, the U.S. Six on, sits on, I think, six technical time zones, with Alaska being the fifth one and Hawaii is the sixth one. <clears throat> Let's see. He says, yep, I work. Hassan says, yep, I work in UTC every day. UTC is coordinated universal time, but because of the French, it is abbreviated UTC instead of CUT. The French, they lose a few wars and think they own everything. <laughs> oh. So that's why they call it UTC instead of CUT. Okay. I've never known that. I just know that they just use, I just, I've always used UTC. And Something I'm, that's, I'm kind of bummed out, like with my radios, I have an older Omni 6 on the bottom, and it has the clock mode built into it. So you can actually, it's, I have it set for UTC time. So when I power this radio on, like right now, it's 15.08. That's what time it is, UTC. But the Omni 7, its newer sibling, doesn't have the clock. It's like... How hard would it have been? There's plenty of display space on this thing, too. It's got a huge LCD display. They could have stuck the clock on it. There's room. There's plenty of room for the clock. And they just didn't do it. And now they're out of business, so there's no accessing the firmware to be able to write it in yourself. <laughs> As clocks are simple to write into anything with a microprocessor. It's got a clock already. You just need to read it and put it on the display. So, yeah figures <laughs> doctor Hassan says doctor I am so sorry sir but your wife is in a coma and we are not sure when she will wake up husband no worries gonna go golf she'll be up before the second hole <laughs> that's pretty funny <laughs> check something here oh wow if y'all haven't done it yet hit the like button I have to remind that because I keep forgetting. Um, I'm going to bring this up. Oh, wait. No, I don't need that one. All right, go ahead. It's loading. Wow, it's loading a lot. Why is it taking so long? Get done. What I was going to do was I'm gonna close these two pages out and get them out of the scene. There we go. Alright. What I need to do is minimize this. There we go. Close that window. Okay. Ah, there we go, got it. Now um, this one. Where are you at? Let's see if I can find it. Well, I just changed colors. 
That was fancy. <laughs> ah, there we go. Now, let's close that. Because I've done launched it two or three times. But here's what I want to do. I want to go here. I'll close this. Close this. There. Now, we're getting somewhere. Okay. <laughs> This is my website. <laughs> and um, if you go to my website and you click, it's going to launch with this page is the first page. And I really need to go in here and work on it because some of the photos aren't properly sized and it creates this weird kind of effect. I, I like it on the web page to have this cleaner border profile. As you can see, I've got pictures of things I photograph for my street and, and such and low light. Then there's a nature photo page where I've got nature photos. Um, just in general, we've seen this before, I'm pretty sure. If you went to my website at all, you've seen this. Okay, and then I have a photography blog. And I talk about things on my blog that I don't make videos about that don't seem to work right for a video or... Uh, was going to do a video and it just didn't seem like it fit the format or I just couldn't figure it out. So I've gotten to where I like to write little blog posts about it, you know, and it's easy for me to do this without making a big video production out of it. It always works. And then, you know, okay, go back up. And then I have the amateur radio blog, which talks mainly about my adventures in QRP radio. There it is plugged in, the one I showed you just a minute ago. And this, there's the 705 where I was using it in Florida. The antenna tuner module for it is this thing laying on the ground back here. And it has a remote cable that is this cable here I've built that connects the two of them. The antenna comes off of it. But and then Morse code key I bought. Me outside in the cold. Another radio I like to use. This is the Elacraft K1. You know, but... There is a there's a long list you can see over here that the slider there is there is a lot of blog posting about amateur radio. If you're interested in parts on the air or QRP, which is low power radio, or Morse code, then yeah, I went one day when it was raining like cats and dogs. <laughs> you can see the antenna counterweights laying in the water. This is known as a nano VNA. This is a vector network analyzer and. These things are very powerful analytical tools that have become pocketable due to technology advancements. If you, if you do much with radio, this thing is super handy. It's also usable with anything that has to do with frequencies, like radio frequency, anything. You can work on radios, computers. There's all sorts of things that you can do with a, with a vector network analyzer. I only know just a handful of what it can do. Like this, I'm doing antenna measurements here. I'm, I'm checking SWR plots versus this green line is a Smith chart plot showing impedance versus SWR on a frequency curve. And like you can see, I'm between 13 and 15 megahertz and I'm at 13.9 megahertz at the lowest null, which means I was a little bit low on frequency. I need to shorten the antenna to push it up to 14050. But that's a, this, is the, this is a tool. It's a very powerful tool that used to cost tens of thousands of dollars and was enormous and took up space on a workbench. And now it fits in your shirt pocket and it's 50 bucks and it's battery powered. And they work shockingly well. Um, mine is currently right here actually yeah i brought it in because i'm going to test a rf choke i've built let me just switch back this is where i store mine it's in a little pouch i bought at a ham fest a little bin but that's the whole thing i'm going to actually charge it up it may be charged let me see yeah it came on um but yeah, this thing is incredibly useful. Plus, it, it is capable of being ported to a computer so the computer can talk to it, and it has a memory card in it. But I, I haven't learned how to like save stuff to the memory card. But yeah, you, it's, it's just it's a really handy piece of equipment, and they're not very expensive. 
once I once I got into these, I understand its value, and yeah, I recommend them. They're a little techy to learn, but they work surprisingly well. Yeah, I have a I have a piece of this is RG174 coax, and I've made this RF choke out of a toroid by wrapping a bunch of turns around it. And what I'm going to do is plot it through this and see how good the rejection is with the choke and because it's getting rid of what is known as common mode currents and so i've brought it in to do that test what's the battery on it do i need to plug it in and charge it let me see yeah no actually it's got plenty of battery charge on it i keep this i've got a little kit built i keep in here with it. it's got a bunch of different adapter cables and things to be able to hook it up to different stuff yeah and there's a Leatherman in here so I can change connectors. I got, I am an idiot when it comes to, to widgets. I buy all kinds of crazy crap. Have you ever seen, let me see if I can focus in on this a little closer. Yeah, there we go. Uh, in focus there, uh, get the light right on it. This is the SOG brand tool. And as you can see, it's like, I'm watching the screen to make sure it stays in focus, but it's got this this gear drive wrench so it adds more torque as you move it. Plus it has a crimping tool here and it's got like they've radius the edges of the sheet metal so it doesn't bind your hand as bad. These little covers snap open and allow you access to the tools on the inside. It's got a really nice file in this one. Um, but it's big, if you can see. The Leatherman I carry is significantly smaller. And the Leatherman actually has a belt clip. I don't really care about the belt clip because I don't use it. But it does have it to where if you stick it in your pocket, like say you're in a hurry or something, you can stick it in your pocket and belt and pocket clip it and it and it will work. But yeah, I've got let me see, yeah. I have got so many of these. I've got like two or three of this thing. I keep one in the truck and one on the refrigerator and <laughs> these things are everywhere. I got one out in the reloading shed. I have Leatherman super tools. I keep one in my luggage. So when I travel, I'll have a, a Leatherman with me, you know. But yeah, I've got so many of these silly things. I just keep them everywhere. There we go. And just passed it back in. There we go. Now I'm in focus. But I keep all that in the kit so that I can work my VNA. But yeah, this thing is super handy. I'll have to look up a YouTube video as soon as we finish this stream on how to use it to measure coax and like choke information, inductance and things. Yeah. Oh, another one of my favorite radios, the Tentec Argonaut 5. I didn't realize I had all of them pictured in the video or in the blog. There's how I log. Yeah. There's like a, a chart showing where all I contacted that day. And as you can see, I spend a lot of time alone when I do my radio. It's just me and my radio. Most of the time, there's nobody else there. <laughs> I just like it. I don't know. It's just me. But okay, what I'm showing here is I've, I've put this adapter that converts this PL259 screw connection to a BNC quick connect so I can quickly unhook the coax, hook it to my VNA, tune the antenna to a different band, and once I've got the antenna tuner tuned to the new band, I just move the coax back to the radio and switch bands. And that is a really rapid way of changing frequencies. And of course, the power cable and those are what I keep it in. This, But this radio doesn't have an antenna tuner built into it. I have a couple that do, but this one does not. And that's how I tune with it. I have an external tuner. I don't think I have a picture of it in here. Oh, this is where I've done a fan upgrade. That's how loud the fan was on the radio to start with. That's how loud the fan was when I got done. That was the ambient room noise. So, you know, I took like 20 dB of noise off by changing the fan out to this silent fan. And then and I go through how to do it and everything. I forgot about that. But, yeah. All right, I'm going to jump back. Okay, amateur radio hour is over. I'll stop talking about it. <laughs> I just like to I just like to share. That's my other real hobby I enjoy. David is smoking in the bandit running moonshine with his radios. <laughs> I have I have close range radios too. These little radios reach a long way. As you saw by that map, 
Um, let me just jump back and scroll back up. It'll be right there. It is. You can see I was in. This is this is at Cloudland Canyon, most likely. Yeah, K twenty one sixty nine is Cloudland Canyon. It's right here in my across the valley. And you can see I made it all the way out to Washington, right at the the border with Canada. Was the furthest contact from the looks of things. That's New Brunswick, Canada, or maybe on the main Canada border. That's a Canadian. You know, there's Texas. There's Arizona. That looks like New Mexico, California, Kansas, Colorado. Yeah, this radio's reached a long way, but the close range stuff. The close range stuff is right there, and I have a base radio on the top here that actually reaches the local repeater. Uh, I'm not going to key it because there may be somebody listening, and I'll commit to a conversation if I put my call sign into it. <laughs> hmm. He says that's water in the mason jar, but we all know that's moonshine. What? This is water. You have to sip water, right? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> oh, you guys are having fun. I <laughs> just bought the Leatherman Charge. Really? Which one is this? This one's the free P4. I like these because uh, once you unlatch it, they don't have all that friction anymore. It's got a rare earth magnet in the back so you can work it with one hand without fighting it. That's what I liked about it. Um, and the way they've got the tools, the tools are on the outside so the inside is radiused so it doesn't dig into your hand when you're trying to get a hold of something like a cotter pin and pull it out. It just doesn't chew your hand up as bad. They've radiused all these sheet metal corners. I think these panels are actually aluminum so they're a bit a little lighter. But yeah, all the tools are out here. They got it all on like a Swiss Army knife on the outside. You got a knife blade, another knife blade. Well, that's a saw, of course. And then another a serrated knife. You got your steak knife. And then they've got the pair of scissors, the little Swiss Army knife. And these, I use these way more than I would like to admit. This little pair of scissors is like the handiest little thing ever. You wind up needing that tiny little pair of scissors for all sorts of crap. <laughs> But I haven't looked at the the charge. I'll have to look it up. Is it small enough you just carry it in your pocket like a pocket knife? Excuse me. Got an itch right between my eyes. The K4 SOD repeater ID in the at the 20 after mark, roughly. <laughs> B and C's rule. They do it QRP power. They won't handle they won't handle more than about 50, 60 watts, I think, is about the max that a B and C will handle. So don't be putting them on your big HF rig or you'll be melting that center pin out of them. They're not meant for high power. I've always had the belt case. Okay, well, here's what we're about to do. Google is your friend. Let's see what we've got here. Images. Holy moly, Batman. Is yours a charge plus or just the charge? There's the charge. All right. Let it load. There we go. Transition. There it is. The charge. Yeah. It basically, oh, it has the the inserted screwdriver, the little bit screwdriver mod. Mine don't have that. I think these are about 125, and it looks like the charge is about 190. Man, their Amazon is really getting in on the game at 300 bucks when you can buy it from Leatherman Direct for 160. <laughs> REI has them for 190. I would just drive over to REI in Chattanooga and get one. That's a cool looking Leatherman, dude. I like the replaceable jaws. Mine, I've, I've injured the jaws in mine and literally took a diamond file and filed off the burrs. Oh, it's got the tiny little Allen wrench. I guess that's a pin. 
but that's a cool thing that little because you that's got micro screwdrivers and stuff so where's the rest of the screwdrivers in a kit let's see this is all kinds of extras I'm not really sure what I'm seeing here titanium Dave where is the best place to buy the nano VNA um, let's see if I can get you the link to this particular one the okay nano VNAs let me switch back over and get off of this for a second. I'm going to jump back to that. Um, that's a nice Leatherman, dude. That's a really high quality piece of equipment. I like that one. The The one I use is for sale on Amazon, and they're like 50 or 60 bucks. Let me go here. Um, here we go. Now, I'll go to the actual link. What I'm going to do is send the link to myself and then I'm gonna post it in the chat I don't know how to do it from my phone let me see here. where's the link there's a share button on here there it is share copy okay now let's see yeah here you can do it from here Paste, send, okay. Now, <laughs> it's a lot to do. <laughs> Let's see here. This one? That's interesting. I don't see it. That don't surprise me. All right, Bass Angler. I'm going to text it to you and you put it in the chat. <laughs> Let's see. Um, where's that at? There we go. All right. Now. <laughs> Drop that in the chat, Bass Angler. That's the actual Amazon link, straight to the one I use. <laughs> I'd buy the Chinese knockoff on eBay. Yeah, I mean, the only thing with like, okay, uh, Hassan says, I used to talk to people from Asia on high frequency radios. Yeah, I can hear Japan occasionally, but where I'm located in the southeastern U.S. and the particular antenna I'm using, I don't hear them real well. I could hear them pretty good when I was in Hawaii. Uh, I messed uh, I messed around there and listened a little bit, and I could I could hear them pretty good there, but uh, I never made contact with any of them. Japan's still a long way from Hawaii. It's further to Japan than it is back to the mainland. I think it's over two thousand miles. It's a long way. The belt case has a slot for the black pieces in the photo. All sorts of interchangeable bits. Oh, I see them now. Those are all. Those are all bits slid crossways through it. Okay. Wow. HF says, uh, high, HF radios are awesome when the atmosphere cooperates. And right now it has been. I have been getting all kinds of, like, I worked Poland the other day. Um, there was a, a pole. There was a guy in the Azores Islands that I got. I've been getting some pretty interesting distant stations even with my little five watt radios ah man that's a short version why did it make it so small how'd you compress the thing down that's it okay well done <laughs> that's what I said it's this giant thing <laughs> oh I see it sent the text okay Right. Mm. 
make a note. There we go. <clears throat> so, I've covered all sorts of stuff. It's been an hour and a half on the, on the live stream. This week we have several sunspots turning in. Nice. That works to our advantage. Um, that's cool but yeah uh, I'm going to see about working with this camera a lot more in the coming weeks I've got some projects I'm going to start doing like I'm going to actually try to start doing some videos for you guys and uploading a video instead of just doing a live stream and copping out <laughs> hence the new audio recorder I've got two videos in the can on the on the recorder and the and the GoPro, but I'm thinking about scuttling them and reshooting them with um, with better stuff like this. And like I said, I think I'll build me my my demo table because holding it up to the camera is really difficult to keep it in focus, and it bothers people sometimes. But yeah, that's that's been some stuff I've been wanting to talk about early next week, actually. Yeah. Well, this week's been good as far as HF goes. But the Z8 looks interesting, but I think there will be a price adjustment after it's out for a while. I think you'll see it come down to 3000 uh, It and it probably won't take it long, especially if you can get Z9s for less than six now. Like I said, once you factor in, like over in Europe, once you factor in VAT, the value-added the, the value tax, that VAT tax, once you add that in plus sales tax, it's it's all you know. You're like I said, you're closing in on Z9 levels of, of dollars, and for the Nikon enthusiast, especially someone who likes Nikon equipment because it's Nikon equipment, you're basically nudging me into Z9s. I mean, you really are, and that's the only thing. That's the only camera right now that Nikon makes that I'm really interested in is a Z9. After seeing what Ray does with his, I would like to get a bigger full frame version of a Z mount camera, even though I'm going to be using the FTZ so I can put my 500 on it. Yeah, I know you lose the cropping and all of that jazz, but I, I just like the, I like the, the focus and the ergonomics better than this little bitty camera this the little camera is nice but you struggle with it you do at times so to each his own i wouldn't mind getting the 1.4 teleconverter and um, because nikon makes a z mount teleconverter now so i could put that z mount teleconverter ftz and then the 500 phase fresnel and have 720 millimeters or something like that you know and it would be a it would be a nice system and then you know your 45 megapixels at 700 instead of 20 at 700 which is what the z50 has so it gives me a little more to work with but that would be the only thing that's the only knock on body that i'm looking at that i would like to have right now i mean the d850 getting one of those second hand would be kind of cool because you can get it for reasonable money if you get one with a reasonable shutter count you know but yeah Russell Horton's in the house. How you doing, Russell? I've been seeing you've been doing a lot of portrait photography lately. I watch you on on Facebook. <laughs> you can shoot in crop mode on a full frame mirrorless camera, is what he just said, and you can, which just auto crops the image, and then it auto crops, and then refills the frame with that cropped image, so you can kind of see what you would get once you crop, and that does give you a lot of latitude. What I like about shooting in full frame mode on the full frame camera as opposed to the crop mode though is that I can see around what I'm what I'm going to crop to. So I can like see if there's something entering the frame. It's kind of like frame lines in a Leica rangefinder. You can see what's entering and exiting what the image capture area is going to be. So it's kind of a convenient thing. And you know, and that way you can just crop in. Uh, 
if the Z9 Mark II or Z10 or whatever they call the next flagship has, you know, a 90 megapixel sensor, you'll be able to crop a lot. I mean, even at 45, you can crop generously and still have a really nice image because even with the little 20.9 or whatever the Z50 has, you can crop on it some and it still produces good images. I mean, a 4K monitor is only 8 megapixels on the screen. So, you know, you got a big 4K screen and you throw that picture up on it, that's only an 8 megapixel image. You know, they have to compress it down to fit that 4K screen. Our third, was it 8K is 32 megapixel? It's just like, wow, 45 can be cropped so heavily and you can, it's just crazy. The resolution is insane nowadays that we have to work with. Just boggles my mind what we have. I'm looking at the chat to make sure I didn't miss anything. No, it looks good. There's a lot happened today on this. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh, basically what I was wanting to go over in today's stream. I was wanting to share with you about the new audio recorder and the D850 rumors and talk about that a little bit. And then um, just some general stuff like I'm hooking this up. I got it to work, so I know I've got that functionality worked out. I also got to get a light. Every, this room is pretty dark, even with the lights on. And when this camera is running as a webcam, it's this lens is kind of kind of small on the aperture size. It's f four or five on the on the widest setting, and f five six on it on twenty millimeters wide open. So I need a good bit of light for this to work. So I'm gonna have to get me an extra light and set it up somewhere wherever I do the showing you stuff on camera scene or like this or whatever i gotta have some more light this one ain't got enough lumens <laughs> so Whew. the cat hasn't moved yeah she's changed position a little yeah i haven't you girl why are you looking at me like that for why are you sitting on my camera get off of it <laughs> <laughs> She waits on me to come in here, and then she comes in here and sleeps. <laughs> She'll bug me. She'll come in the other room if I'm in there doing something and sit down on the floor and just look at me. And then when I get up, she'll walk in here and get on the bed, expecting me to sit here so she can go to sleep. Get a ring light. Yeah, I probably will for this camera, and I'll mount it for this one, for, for a camera. Then I can use this light for the B camera, because I've got a big I've got a big soft box light right here. It's an LED color temperature adjustable panel, and I've got it a, a, a dialed in to match the color temperature of these other lamps in the room, so everything works out. I got the the temperature on the video camera set manually, so it doesn't constantly mess with like if the sun spills through a hole or something. And it's like on like 3,000, some kind of ludicrous pushed all the way to one end setting to get it to balance right. But welcome to weird lights. <laughs> My cat is chasing the Great Dane. <laughs> oh, Lord. Cats decolonize the mind. <laughs> I think she stays up all night because she lives, we, we put her out at night. And uh, that way, that's where she goes out, goes to the bathroom. We don't have a litter box. She just goes outside. She's housebroken, basically. She'll stay in all day. And if she goes to the door, we let her out. And she eats outside. She drinks outside. She does everything else outside, but she comes in here and sleeps all day. <laughs> but yeah, she's a good cat. She's old. She's probably six or seven years old at this point. And for an outdoor cat, that's really old. Might lose its tail, Bass Angler. <laughs> All right, guys. I think I'm going to sign off and probably go take some photos and maybe shoot a video. Now that I've got my video rig kind of rebuilt, and i got to put my tripod back on it, but um, the, the mic for it is right here. That's what I'm using. Let's see if I pull this in. 
this boom I've got rigged up to the vertical stand that the camera is on, I'm currently just hard piping the audio straight into the camera. And the reason I'm doing that is because I did a Zoom call, and Zoom doesn't allow me to run external audio. It doesn't, because, you know, if you run an external mic, you have to sync them. The video takes longer to process through OBS, so they give you the functionality so that you can actually put a delay on the audio of some, you know, of a specific amount of time you tell it. And I use like 220 milliseconds, and that resyncs the audio with the video. But when you pop the audio into the camera proper, you don't have to do that. It's the audio codec is transmitted with the video information and it's automatically synced. It's kind of an easy way around the block. So I want to put this mic back on that camera and uh, I'll put my uh, USB mic back on the stand. I've, it's still in there. I just have to turn it on. You know, I've just got that function turned off in OBS, but, but yeah. I gotta put this mic back where I was using it. Oop, went too far. It was right there in front. <laughs> but yeah, if you guys have anything that you, any thoughts, put them in the comments. And if you want to chat with me about stuff that we've talked about today, shoot me an email. It's georgiafotog at gmail.com. It's on all of my videos in the description. Uh, if it ain't in the live stream descriptions, I'll fix that at some point. I'm, I'm learning how to edit the descriptions on the stream so that it can, I can have that data in there. But all the videos have the, web, have the email if you need to contact me. And uh, until next time, you guys get your camera out and go take a picture with it. All right? We'll see you all.